flying saucers were real? What if Hitler had a saucer and planned an attack on New York? What if America developed a radar invisible flying saucer and the CIA used alien invaders as a cover for top secret military experiments? Tonight, we reveal that all of that is true. For 50 years, the world has been flying saucer crazy. We've seen so many that more British people now believe in aliens than in God. There were flying saucers everywhere. It's just imagination, but I saw them just... The truth is rather more complex. Flying saucers do exist, but they don't come from outer space. They come from Earth and the darkest recesses of military research. It all began in 1932 in Bucharest, when this man, a flight engineer called Henry Coanda, made an extraordinary discovery using a disc-shaped flying object. One of the first people to see Coanda's experiments was then a 20-year-old aeronautical student called Radu Manikatide. The saucer rose to the ceiling and remained there. I thought it was something extraordinary. It would never have crossed my mind. You know, I was only used to the idea of normal flying. Young Radu had just witnessed the world's first flying saucer. And this is how it worked. If you draw air down onto a curved shape like a saucer, it follows the surface of that shape. By literally sucking the air from above his saucer so it flowed round and underneath, Coanda found he could both lower the air pressure above and raise it below, causing the craft to levitate. This became known as the Coanda effect. It's the principle at the heart of saucer flight. It was a very simple idea, but of course you had to have thought of it in the first place. Then something happened that was to change the entire course of saucer development. In 1939, war broke out, and the world rushed headlong into a search for new weapons and new ways of deploying them. Coanda's simple idea was about to have its day. Nazi technology chief Werner von Braun led the development of new weapons from his top-secret headquarters in Pienemünde in Germany. Here, he developed state-of-the-art weapons of terror, like the V-2 rocket. This was really the, the central location from which all projects were run for quite a, quite a long time. What few people knew was that 260 miles away in Prague, the Nazis had an even more secret research establishment and were working on a fantastic new flying craft. And the firm at the heart of these frightening new developments? Skoda. The SS was using, and the Air Force were using Skoda to manufacture aircraft of all sorts. But by 1944, things were going badly wrong for Hitler. He needed to reassure his allies, chief amongst them Italian dictator Benito Mussolini. Hitler told Mussolini he had spectacular new aircraft that could change the course of the war. He called them his Wunderwaffen. In July 1944, Hitler invited Mussolini to Germany with his chief advisor on weapons technology, Luigi Romerso. Later, Romerso was taken to the top secret Skoda base where the new aircraft was being developed. Today, Luigi Romerso is 84 and living in Italy. He has agreed to describe what he saw that day. Yes, I saw it. For me, it was something exceptional. Round with the central cockpit made in plexiglass, and with jets all around it that made up the means of propulsion. Luigi Ramersa had seen the world's first production flying saucer, and it was a Skoda. Well, you see, the pilot drawn in the cockpit. The pilot would drive the disc standing up. This is one of the men who actually helped create that flying saucer. 
His name, Andreas Epp. Epp had invented a disc-shaped flying gunnery target and sent the prototype to the Luftwaffe High Command, suggesting it could be adapted for manned flight. In an interview recorded before his death in 1997 and never broadcast until now, Epp described how he began to suspect his designs had been stolen. I kept hearing reports that people in Prague were working on the construction of flying discs and that progress was being made. Furious over being sidelined, Epp drove to the Prague test ground to find out what was going on. I had my Leica A camera with me, then suddenly I saw a flying saucer. It had no wings, absolutely none. I took a photo and wound on the film, but it was already directly over me. Then I took a second photo, and I could see it was a flying saucer. Epp was devastated by what he felt was the theft of his saucer. My flying saucer, where can you be? Since that sad night that you sailed away from me. Epp would get his own back later, but in the meantime, the Germans had a flying saucer. It actually flew and flew pretty, pretty well. This is what the German saucer looked like. It was based on the flying saucer principle, the effect discovered by Henry Coanda, whereby the ship created an area of low pressure above it and literally sucked itself into the air. But it combined this with other new technologies, such as the helicopter and the jet engine. It was fast, versatile, and could potentially carry a heavy payload of bombs underneath. But perhaps most important in a country which had lost so many runways to Allied bombing, it could take off vertically. These saucers worked in one sense almost like a helicopter in that they had rotating vanes. The vanes would rotate underneath the saucer and were powered by a jet, the same jet that moved the, the saucer forward, would be directed up to spinning these vanes to give it lift. They were to be used as a bomber. Every machine built in those years was a war weapon. They were to be used as a response to the Allies in what was to be the final battle of the Third Reich. According to Remerser, an increasingly desperate and deluded Hitler plotted to use his secret new weapons in a devastating attack on New York. Hitler said once, God forgive me for the last five minutes of the war. He wanted to unleash the weapons they developed. It never happened, of course. The Russians were advancing on Prague, and while the German rearguard fought desperately on the streets, the scientists in the Skoda plant tried to destroy the evidence of their research. The pressure of the enemy was unbearable, and the airfield was blown up with dynamite, and the saucer blew up with the rest of the equipment. They pushed the saucers from their hangars onto the tarmac, put explosive charges in, and blew them up and let them burn right there on the tarmac in front of everyone. They destroyed the saucers themselves, but the Nazi scientists who built them had survived and the victorious allies turned on each other in a fight to get them. So who would win the race for the secrets of the Sossaman? In 1947, pilot Kenneth Arnold was flying over mountains in Washington state when he saw nine objects shooting across the sky at incredible speeds. He thought that they traveled in a motion that he compared to saucers being skipped on water, which is kind of an unusual analogy, but that name stuck, and that's why they became flying saucers. The sighting has become celebrated as the moment the flying saucer age was born. It sparked a frenzy of public excitement, but it was a frenzy fueled by paranoia, because this was the start of the Cold War.
This coalition was to be torn asunder. The allies of the Second World War were now enemies. Already an iron curtain had dropped around Poland, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria. In public, West and East mounted huge displays of their biggest and best military hardware. But there was a secret war too, a ruthless competition to acquire Nazi science and Nazi scientists. Whoever controlled this technology after World War II would really be ahead militarily. So there was a scramble between the Allied powers, the Russians, the French, the, the British, even though they had been allies, to obtain as much of this technology as possible for their own side. And that's why the US government was so alarmed by the saucers seen by pilot Kenneth Arnold. As this secret document shows, it meant Russia had acquired German flying saucer technology and was building them. The Germans had been so far in advance of the United States, they thought that if the Russians had captured scientists or installations responsible for these secret weapons, that maybe the Soviets were now ahead too. The Americans were right. The Russians were building saucers, and to help them, they'd spirited someone very useful from Germany. Andreas Epp, the German saucer engineer. Immediately after the war, uh, Andreas Epp decided that he wanted to work in the Soviet Union. So he moved to Rostock and uh, was contacted there by Soviet agents. And the Soviet agents seemed to know who he was. And of course, Epp liked this a lot because somebody was acknowledging that he actually was of some value. And, uh, Whereas before he had been minimized. I thought to myself, I have to carry on. I owe it to the people who worked on it. And I started to build a flying disc. Epp worked primarily on the steering mechanism of the Soviet saucer. His specialty was the guidance part of this type of saucer. In other words, making it respond to controls, linking the controls to the to the, uh, the saucer movements itself. According to Epp, the Russian saucer was extraordinarily maneuverable, but it was also versatile, and it had to be. It was a jet, and they wanted something that they could use, interestingly enough, in polar regions. The reason for that was obvious. The quickest way to North America was over the pole. That was a fact not lost on an increasingly paranoid America. Even Hollywood suspected the Russians were up to something sorcerous. Now the first country that learns the secret of the flying saucer will control the skies of the world. I don't want that country to be Russia. A lot of the 